morning I want to talk to you about the subject of the attributes of God. How many of you know what attributes are? Attributes are that which uh, can be attributed to us. For example, everyone in here has attributes. If I brought each individual up and, and I asked everybody in this church to describe those individuals, they would describe their attributes. They would say, well, you know, Jim is a prayer warrior. Jim, he's a praying man. He loves to pray. Amen. And they would say that Granny, man, she's a tremendous cook and baker, and that's her attributes. Amen. They would say that, you know, Brandon and, and the praise team, they're singers, they're, the musicians are great musicians. It's their attributes, right? Hopefully we, the people in this world look at us and they have good things to say about our attributes outside of this church. That we're people of integrity, we're a people of honesty, we're, we're people that are a people of compassion. Those are attributes. Well, how many of you know that God has some attributes too? Amen? Yes, He does. And to, we have to understand what are the attributes of God. Because so many people don't know uh, everything that we need to know about God. Well, why is that important, Pastor? It's just some useless information, isn't it? Oh, no, not at all. Because when you know who God is, and you know what He's about, and you know what His nature is, you know what His character is, you know what His attributes are, it helps you to understand and relate to Him even more. You know, there's a lot of people out there, that they say, that they, I don't know who this they is, but people say that we have an image and a vision of God based upon the image and vision we have of, had of our earthly father. So if your earthly father wasn't very compassionate and loving, your, act, your idea of God is that he's not very compassionate and loving. Maybe that's what you struggle with. Or if you're, uh, you know, your remembrance of your earthly father was he was an abuser and he was critical and cold and distant, that's going to be your, your understanding and that's going to be your mind and your, your thoughts towards God if you, don't, if you don't know the truth. But what I love about the Bible is His Word is true. Amen? His Word is true. And what I want to do is I want to give you the truth in regards to God, in regards to His attributes, so you'll understand exactly what those attributes are. Now, there's 17 of those attributes. Amen? And we're not going to get into all of them today, praise God, but we're going to, we're going to get a good uh, foothold into them this morning. I want you to understand basically who your Father is, who Father God is and what He's about, and it'll help you to really understand the fullness of that and to really delve into a good relationship with them. Now for some of you, these are things you've known all your life. Hey, that's okay. Just kind of, It'll put you back into remembrance and renew. It'll renew some things for you. But for others, this is a revelation. There's a lot of people that, that don't have not dug into the Word, have not been taught the Word, and they just don't know. So let's get into it this morning. First attribute of God that we want to talk about this morning is God is eternal. What does the word eternal mean? Well, there was a very famous professor from years ago, a very famous professor from years ago, I wondered why I wasn't getting much, uh, a professor from years ago who uh, went into his class and he was teaching. And one of his students, it was a philosophy class, one of his students asked him, uh, can you describe eternity to us? Show us what eternity is. He said, absolutely, no problem. So he went over and he put a little dot on the chalkboard, turned around and put, kept going, 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 and literally climbed out the window and didn't come back till the next day. That's eternity. Eternity is forever. Many times eternity is described as a figure eight. Amen? Whenever they would cut covenant in the Old Testament, what they would do is the two people that would go into covenant after all the covenant rituals, they would be back to back like this, and then they would walk in a figure eight, and they would meet in the middle. Figure eight represents uh, infinity. There's no beginning, and there's no end. God is eternal. Amen. Where did he come from? That's the number one question. Well, if we could answer that, then he wouldn't be God. Amen. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He has no origins. He's God. Praise the Lord. Well, do you have scripture on that? Absolutely. Psalm 102 verse 12 says this. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. Everybody say forever. Forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. Job chapter 36 verse 26 says, Behold, look how God is great, and we know Him not. <laughs> The number of his years is unsearchable. Amen. Now, Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures, I already quoted it to you, says this about God. God says this about himself. I am the Alpha, that means beginning, and Omega, the end, says the Lord God. 
who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Come on, let's put our hands together and praise the infinity. Hallelujah. That's what makes Him God. And we understand that Psalm chapter 90 verse 2 says these words, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth, and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So before these mountains were formed, before the ground we're standing on was here, before anything was ever spoken into existence, He was God. Amen. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says this, for sake of reference, that we have been chosen from the foundation of the world. Amen? Before the earth was ever made, before creation was ever made, not only was God there, but God thought of you. God thought of me. He, he, he put us in this generation. He made us for this day. He orders our steps. The steps of a righteous person are set up of the Lord. Amen and amen. Well, with the second, so we understand that God is eternal. He is forever. Amen. The, and I remember as a child, this stuff used to blow my mind about God. I remember my, my sisters would come home from, or we were raised in a, a private school, Catholic school at a young age. A lot of people up north work. And they would come home and I would sit on their laps and I would want to hear all the stories about what they learned about God that day. And I was amazed. It just blew my mind that how can God be eternal? How can he just, oh, where did he come from? You know, I've always had a teaching mind from the time I was a child. I always, and teachers ask a lot of questions. I, they want to know, amen. I always wanted to know where did he come from? How did he get there? Where is his origins? Where is he at? Where is he setting? I had a million and one questions to ask. And I know that the Bible answers all of those questions for us. Isn't that wonderful? So we understand that God is eternal. The second thing I want you to understand about God, the attribute of God, is He is immutable. What, is, what that means is this. He never changes. Isn't that encouraging to know? Do you know when somebody never changes, you know what you can do to that person? You can trust them. You know when people get married today, husband and wives get married today, there's no guarantee that that other person is not going to change. You can't guarantee it. We see marriages, not all the time, but many times where people have gotten married and didn't work out, and they say they, they, that person changed. Something changed them. <coughs> Maybe we were raised up, and, and our parents changed. Life changed them, and circumstance changed. And we go into a job, and we love it, but then they sell out to another company or another group of bosses come in, and, and, and what once was wonderful all of a sudden has changed. And we as human beings, especially the older we get, if you're honest with yourself, we don't like change very much, do we? But isn't it comforting? It is for me and refreshing to know that we serve a God who is immutable. That means that He never, ever, ever changes. For the Bible says in Psalm 107, 102, verse 27, it says, But you are the same, and your years have no end. Amen. We understand that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible records Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, He's the same today, and He is the same forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And James uh, chapter 1, hallelujah, says this, verse 17, every good and perfect God is uh, every good and perfect gift is from above. So every good gift you have in your life, every perfect gift you have in your life, that little baby right there, he's from above. He's a good and perfect gift for me, from the Father of lights, with whom there is, listen, listen, there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, every gift that the Father gives us is a good gift. Good gift is from God, and He doesn't change. Amen. He's not going to take it from us. Hallelujah. God doesn't take. Well, what about this situation? What about that situation? The Lord does not take. Amen? Job says, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But Job didn't understand the whole picture when he said that. There were some things that were taken from Job, but God never took it. The devil came in to kill, steal, and destroy. But everything, everything that the enemy took had to be returned a hundredfold, twofold. Can I get an amen? amen. It was returned unto Job's life. Everything he lost was returned. Yeah. God gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. The amen. devil takes and it comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Amen? In Him there is no darkness. He is the Father of lights. 
Praise His holy name. Amen. It's going to be hard to teach this message today without getting happy and excited. <laughs> Whenever we talk about the goodness of God, the attributes of God, who He is, doesn't it just make you want to shout? Doesn't it? Okay. Does it? Well, maybe it's just me. Praise the Lord. So He is immutable. That means He never changes. Now let me explain that to you for a minute. Back in the ancient days, whenever they would go into a covenant, two parties would go into a covenant, and when they would enter into a covenant, all assets were mutually shared. Their enemies were mutually shared. Their liabilities were mutually shared. Uh, their, everything they had that was good was mutually shared. When we got saved, we entered into a covenant with Almighty God, the covenant that was cut through Jesus Christ, amen, on the cross. And because of that covenant, we inherit eternity. Why do we get eternal life? Because God does not die. He lives forever. So therefore, if we're saved, we will live forever. We don't have to live broke with our needs not met because the Bible says He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And He says to us in His Word, if you'll ask me, I'll give it to you. Ask me and I'll give it to you. Amen? Why do we get to be healed? Why do we have a right to expect healing from God in His covenant? Because He's not sick. Amen. God is not sick. He's not broken down. Why does the Bible say, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? Don't you try to get vengeance on your enemies. The Lord says, I will. Because in a covenant, the, the two parties would enter into agreement. And my, if, I, if I, myself, and, us, and Jim enter into a covenant, his friends become my friends. My friends become his friends. His enemies become my enemies. And my enemies become his enemies. Right? That's how it is with the Almighty God. So guess what? All of your enemies are now God's enemies. Anybody that would dare to stand against you, a gracious and loving Father is full of grace and mercy. But listen, He has a covenant obligation to protect His children. So look at your neighbor and say, don't mess with me. Look at your other neighbor and say, can't touch this. Nah, nah, nah. Can't touch this. Some of the younger people, millennials are looking at me like, what? Say this with me, say, hammer time. Hallelujah. Just had to stir you up a little bit and wake you up a little bit. Amen. So what they would do is they would enter into this covenant. Now here's what they would do. And it, it dispels it out in Genesis 15 for the sake of reference. They would take an animal. They would take certain animals. And they would cut them down the middle. Okay? And they would place them in, 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 in order. And they would, they would lay these dead animals there. And they would walk in a figure eight through it like I just described. And they would meet in the middle. Now here's what that was. Now the Bible says in Genesis 15, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. But now he puts Abraham to sleep. But he tells Abraham to get everything together. Do it. He gives him instruction of how to set this covenant up, this ritual up. Then he puts him to sleep. Why did he put him to sleep? Because the covenant that God has with man has nothing to do with us other than receiving it and being obedient to it. That's all. That, because we can't add anything to it. We've got nothing but our hearts that God wants. We've got nothing to give to this God. So what he would do is he told Abraham, take a heifer, sacrifice it, lay it down, put a she-goat in this corner, put a ram over here, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he had to put them all you know, in certain places. Then he gave him a nap. He said, go to sleep. Abraham conks out. Abraham wakes up, and he sees these two things. Read your Bibles. He sees a smoking furnace and a fiery pot. Some translations say a burning lamp. He sees a smoking furnace and a fire. We think of a furnace as that metal thing in our house. It was like a, it was a, something you cook on, smoking furnace. He sees the smoking furnace and a burning lamp, a fiery pot. That's all he sees walking, going through these dead animals. Well, that's weird. What did that represent? Well, the nation of Israel, many times we as God's people, will go through furnaces of adversity. Amen? That's our part in the covenant. But the fiery pot and the burning lamp represented God because He is light. And in Him there is no darkness. See, God didn't manifest Himself in, in, in material form to Abraham because He could not. Because Abraham was a sinner. We can't stand in the presence of a righteous and holy God in the flesh and, and, and be in His presence because He's righteous, perfect, and holy. That's why when we die, we leave the these, these sin nature in the ground and our spirits go to heaven until, boom, the end of the age and we come back and get this body and we get a new glorified body and meet Him in the sky and live in the eternal kingdom forever. Praise God. 
That's deep. That's another subject. But anyways, Abraham wakes up and he sees all this going on. What did it represent? Why all this dead, this dead stuff here? Because what they would do when they would enter into that covenant is it was a serious covenant. Because if you violated that covenant or broke that agreement, it just didn't ruin your credit like it does today and file bankruptcy and say, oh, shucks. You know? No, 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 this was serious. If you went into an agreement with somebody else, you would shed each other's blood. You would shed your blood, they would shed their blood, and you'd shake on it. You'd mingle that blood together. That's where the handshake came from. You'd mingle that blood together, and you two would become one. And the only way to get out of that covenant was death. So if, you, if I go into a covenant with somebody else and violate that covenant, uh, that person has an obligation to put me to death. And I had an obligation to put them to death. That's how serious this covenant was. So they would walk through this gauntlet of dead animals when they would do this covenant ritual to remind them, man, this is pretty serious, and if I violate this covenant, I'm going to end up just like one of them. So you had to be serious when you entered in to this covenant. And that's the covenant that God made with Abraham. And those objects that I just described, those animals, they were immutable objects. Immutable. That was an indication that this covenant is eternal. And it can only be gotten out of by death. God made a covenant with you and I through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And He is bound by the integrity of His Word. And if He promises to save us, you can count on it. If He promises to provide for us, you can count on it. If He promises healing for us, you can count on it. If He promises us eternal life, you can count on it. If He promises us a sound mind that His Word says we can have, you can count on it. If He promises us peace, you can count on it. If He promises us joy, you can count on it. God is eternal and He is immutable. That means He's forever and He never changes. Come on, let's praise His name. Yes, He's eternal and He never changes. That's awesome. Because we live in a world that's so unstable. Yes, amen. Everything is false. Everything is phony. Everybody's lied to you. Everybody's broke your heart. Everybody's walked out on you. But God never will. Hallelujah. Yes. But you might be sitting there right now saying, but pastor, what about this situation? What about that situation? God let me down here. It might look like God let you down where you're at right now. But I'm here to tell you that at this side of eternity, that might be how it's looking. But when we get over yonder and we get on the other side, or maybe even a few years down the road in this earth, you'll look back and say, you know what? He came through for me. He came through for me. I needed to go through that. It needed to happen for whatever reason it happened. But God brought good out of it. Can I get an amen? Yes, praise the Lord. So the third thing, that, so number one, God is eternal. Number two is He is unchanging. And number three, He is self-sufficient. What does that mean? That means that God don't need nobody. Amen. Amen. He don't need me. He wants me. He don't need you. He wants you. But He don't need us. Amen. He is self-sufficient. The Bible says that Jesus was a root that grew in the wilderness. Now, how many of you know that in, in a desert wilderness, we think of wilderness from our eastern perspective as these trees of the forest, but the wilderness in Jesus' day was the desert. How many of you know that roots do not grow very well in the wilderness? You know why? Because there's no water under there in a desert. But Jesus was a root that was flourishing in a desert. Why? Because He is self-sufficient. Amen? His sufficiency came from the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three as one. He was God in the flesh. He needs nothing. He was sufficient. Praise the Lord. Pastor, do you have Scripture on that? Absolutely. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. I got it right here for you. Who alone has immortality. That means, again, eternity. He'll never die. Who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see in the flesh. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So he has immortality. He has dwells in light. No one has ever seen him. He has honor and dominion forever. He is self-sufficient. Amen. Needs nothing. Needs no one. Why are we created then? Because God wants somebody. Think about that. God is intellectual. God is emotional. The Holy Spirit has emotions. Did you know that? The Bible says that he can be grieved. Amen. So if you can be grieved, how many of you have ever been grieved by something? You love your children, but man, they mess up and they do something that's not good and it grieves you, doesn't it? You don't hate them, you don't throw them away, but you grieve. 
or somebody passes on that you love and you go through grief. What is grief? We're studying it every Sunday night. <laughs> grief is intense emotional distress. So if the Holy Ghost can be grieved, that means that He can go through emotional distress. Right? So the Holy Ghost can be grieved. He can go through emotional distress. He has feelings. Amen. So I want you to understand this morning that God is self-sufficient, but the reason we were created is because He created the earth, He created the animals, He loved His creation, but He wanted to have a relationship with something a little lower than Himself. The Bible records that we were created a little lower than the angels. You've heard me say it before, but it bears repetition. No, we were created a little lower than Elohim. The actual translation reads that those that translated the King James, those 1611 monks and priests, they were a little afraid of that. A little lower than God? Well, we've got to be humbler than that. No, we're a little lower than the angels. No, no, no. The actual translation says we were created just a smidget lower than God. That's why we have an intellect that other animals don't have. That's why we have emotions that uh, most animals don't have. Amen. I mean, they do to a degree. If you've ever had a pet, yeah, they do. But not like us. Amen. You know, they don't have what we have. They don't, they're not intricate like we are. They're not complex like we are. We were created this way to have an emotional relationship, a spiritual relationship, and yes, even a mental relationship to the best of our ability. We cannot, the Bible says, Isaiah 55 says, His ways are greater than our ways. His, his ways are, are his thoughts thoughts are higher than our thoughts yes but we're the closest thing in creation that comes to equal to be where he's at not even to equal it but to be where he's at that's why it's so important for you and i to have a prayer life that's why it's so important for you and i to have quiet time with the creator that's why you were created he wants you to pour your heart out to him he wants you to hear his heart when you on your side silent and meditating in prayer before him and the holy ghost speaks to your heart and if you're not having that relationship, you're one of the most miserable people that's on this earth because that's why you were created. I'm not saying you're miserable because you're miserable. I'm saying you have a tendency to be miserable unless you can learn to stuff it with all kinds of other things that eventually don't satisfy it and you're still miserable. If you're not happy, you're not fulfilled, spend more time in prayer. Spend more time listening, less time talking. Spend time reading the book of Psalms and all that beautiful poetry. And you'll understand the heart of God. You'll understand the heart of God towards David. And guess what? We're human beings and flesh and blood like David. And guess what? God feels that way about us also. So God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything or anyone. And the fourth thing that God is, is He's omnipresent. What does that mean? That means that God is always with me. No matter what. God is always with me. Isn't that awesome to know that He is always with me? Well, let's take a look at that. The Bible says in uh, uh, Jeremiah 23, 24. Let's read that this morning. Jeremiah 23, 24. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? This is God speaking. Declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? Declares the Lord. In other words, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the first thing they did, they were in the presence of God. God came in His physical form every day and walked with them in the cool of the day. And what is the first thing they did when they sinned? They, fought, they, they hid themselves from the presence of God because they were ashamed, because they were naked, they were exposed. And God said, who told you that you were naked? See, they were, they were exposed and they hid themselves from the presence of God. And God comes through the garden and He's asking them, Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was. He was asking Adam to identify, Adam, where are you? Because when we slip and when we fall and when we get to a place where we've walked out of the presence of God and we get into a place where we're not where we need to be in our relationship with God, God knows exactly where we're at. But until we identify where we're at, repent of where we're at, turn back to the Father, amen, we cannot come back into that fellowship. But God knows where you're at, but do you know where you're at? So that's what he says here. He says, can somebody hide themselves in a secret place? so that I cannot see them? The Lord says, do I not feel heaven and earth? I mean, I'm everywhere. God is 100% everywhere. For the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, for the sake of reference, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Do you realize that this earth is held together because of God? Huh? The sun and the moon and the solar system is held together because of God? i got something else for you. 
your life is held together because of God. And if it's falling apart, I guarantee you it's not because of God. If you'll come back to God, you'll seek God, you'll find God. If you put your heart and give your heart back to God, He'll put your life back together. Because all things, as easy as He holds the universe and the sun and the moon and the stars and creation, <clears throat> as easy as He holds all that together, He holds us in the palm of His hand also. That's what the Bible says. Well, guess what? Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10 also says this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, in the grave, in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you ha your hand shall lead me, and your, your right hand shall hold me. David the psalmist says, and he lived a long time. He'd been through some life. And he said, no matter where I'm at, you're there. You never leave me and you never forsake me. I'm here to tell you this morning that I really believe that one of the greatest agonies of hell, the Bible talks about a place called hell, Luke 16, Revelation chapter 20, that we don't have to go to if we're born again. I think one of the greatest agonies of that place is the fact that God does not dwell there. He does not live there. He does not exist there. See, even the most ranked sinner on this earth gets up every day and looks out and God, His presence is here. Because God's fingerprint is all over creation. And there's still hope, no matter how hopeless the situation may be, for the most rank and vile sinner, reprobate mind, because they still live in the presence of God. But when they depart, I've talked to uh, one man in particular who lives in Jonesboro. He's not a preacher or anything of that nature. They spoke in a few churches about it. But he was a, a, a just a, a, a vile, rank sinner, and he admits it. And he knew he was on his way to hell. But one day he died. Yes, that's right. He died before they brought him back. And he said his, he remembers his exact words where he was headed into this dark tunnel that he could, not, he could not stop the gravitational pull into that tunnel. And when he got into that tunnel, darkness closed him. You talk about a panic attack. There's no EMS to call at that moment. And he's in darkness. And he went from this side over here was still some of the presence of God. Across the threshold, darkness, no presence of God. He said there was literally, the Bible talks about weeping and screaming and gnashing of teeth. There was weeping and screaming and gnashing of teeth. God pulled him out of that. He came back and repented. No more alcohol, no more drugs, nothing. He repented of it, got out of his uh, lifestyle. He was living with, in, in sin. He got out of that lifestyle, repented, didn't want to take any chances. And guess what? He's living for the Lord today. Now, he still likes to fix his, his cars. He still likes to, to, you know, NASCAR and all that stuff. Amen. He's still who he is. But listen, he realized that he did not want to go into eternity without the presence of God. And I think, forget the, forget the, the fire. That's bad enough. Forget the agony. That's bad enough. But I'm here to tell you, I think the greatest tragedy of hell is that there is no presence of God there. Yes. On your darkest day, look. The glory of the Lord shines all around us, even on the cloudiest of days. There's still hope because His fingerprint, His breath, His essence fills this place because He's everywhere. But now there's a difference. Hear me out. There's a difference between the presence of God that's all around us and everywhere we are and the manifested presence of God. Adam and Eve lived in the presence of God. He kind of, He dwelt there, right? They lived there. However, there was times in the cool of the day when the Shekinah glory, the word Shekinah means the physical, tangible presence of God shows up. There was times in the, in the cool of the day when God would come down and talk with them and walk with them hand in hand. They were in the presence. They were always in His presence. But there was times when He showed up. Now we in, as, as Spirit-filled Pentecostals understand exactly what that means, don't we? When that, you hear a preacher say, presence of God is here. Uh, duh, preacher, yeah, we're always in the presence of God. No, 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 you don't understand. Jesus said this. You know, the Bible says that we're always in the presence of God, but Jesus said, whenever two or more of you gather in my name, gather in my power, I will be there. That's confusing. He's always there. Oh, yeah, yeah, he is, in an essence. He's always there. How many of you know uh, you, go, you go visit your mother? 
if you were still privileged to do that. You walk into her house, you're in Mama's house, and you know she's there. She's in another room. You can't see her. You might hear her voice, but you can't see her. But then when Mama comes in the room, it's a whole different scenario, isn't it? Right? Those, are, those are young lovebirds that go through engagements and courtship. Oh, I just want to be in your presence. You hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you. You know, they go through that stage, right? They just can't stand not to be, you know. They're always there, and they're in a relationship, and there's security in that, but it's nothing like when they're together. Huh? That's how it is with the Lord. That's how it is with the two, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there. That's why we work when we come into worship, and many times we'll feel it, people will start to shout or dance or run or scream or whatever they do because they feel that tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I feel sorry for churches that don't experience that, no condemnation. Yeah. They just don't have the revelation we've been given. I couldn't go to a dead church. I couldn't go to a church that does. I'll, I'll endure being laughed at and looked down upon. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Just give yeah. me God's presence. Amen. Yeah. Help me find a spirit-filled church. If I didn't pastor this church tomorrow and never pastor it again, I would find me a spirit-filled church where the presence of God dwells like this place. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there. So, God is omnipresent. He's always there. And the final thing I want to give you this morning is the final thing, the number fifth thing that God is, is God is sovereign. Hallelujah. God is sovereign. Everybody say sovereign. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, Job chapter 42, verse 2 explains it. I know that you can do all things. Everybody say all things. Oh. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You know the fact that can you do all things? Your children think you can. <clears throat> your grandchildren think you can. But realistically, can you do is there can you do all things? You can't, can you? But God can. You know there's nothing that God can't do? That's a false statement. That's right. God can't lie. He's not a man that he should lie. God can't be unfaithful. So there are some things that God can't do. A preacher one time, Brother Hagin was preaching in a church and he made this statement. He goes, um, he goes, there's some things God can't do. Most of the congregation, you know, like yourselves, were kind of sleeping, zoning out, and didn't pay much attention to it. And he said again, there's some things God can't do. Finally, one zealous man in the back said, Pastor, that's a lie. That's heresy. He said, well, yeah. He said, well, guess what? If, that was, if, if, there was, if, if, if that's not true, then why don't, you, why don't God make you pay your tithes? <laughs> why don't God make you get saved? Why don't God make you live right? Why don't God make you, uh, you make a, a commitment in the house of God? Why don't God make you keep it? Why don't God do that? Why don't God make you be better to your husband, better to your wife? You see, we have the freedom of choice. God can influence us. But what you give under the kingdom of God, your covenant giving, no matter what you call it, we need to be given. Amen? Amen. God can't make you live holy. He can't make you live right. He can't make you get saved. But guess what? God can influence you. And His sovereignty, this is where I want to go with this as I close. His sovereignty is based upon works around the freedom of choice that He knows that we are going to make. Now there are times when God can and does interject in human, in humankind, in human situations. There are times when He does that and keeps the car on the road. There's times when he keeps the, uh, you know, he, he, his angels operate in such a way. But those are usually times when we don't have much choice about it. But if I make the decision to jump off of a 10-story building, the Holy Ghost is going to try to influence me not to do it. But if I continue to do it, the Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt, test God. Right. That's where all these people, Amen. these crazy people that uh, handle snakes and all that nonsense, that's why that's so wrong. If you get bit by one, you can believe that you're not going to die. But for, a, for an individual to go out and purposely find one and test God with it and tempt God with it, that is a, that is a sin. Amen. And they're going to die. Right? Mm -hmm. So guess what? God is sovereign. There's nothing that He can't do, in a sense, except override our free will. And it's not that He can't do it. He chooses not to. That's right. He chooses not to. Give you one example before I before I end. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 135, verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the deeps, in the ocean. 
Isaiah 46, 10 says this, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35 says this, all the hidden, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? But again, but again, he's limited by our choice and our choosing because he gave that to us. Unless you go to him, the best thing you can do as a Christian, I've done it many times before, as I said, Lord, I give you permission, Holy Ghost, to override my will to override what I want in this situation. Because I know that your ways are better than my ways. Amen. I know that what you have for me and you want for me is better than anything I could ever imagine for Amen. myself. Amen. So Lord, I don't know what choice to make. I don't know what decision to make. I ask you to close every door that needs to be closed and open up every door that needs to be opened for me. That's one of the best things that you can do. Amen? Amen. Yeah. That's one of the best things that we can possibly ever do in our life. But I want you to understand this morning that God is sovereign. That means that everything that's ever happened to me, God knew about it. And that God has a plan to work it out. Isn't that wonderful? Can we put our hands together and magnify the Lord? Can we thank Him that He is eternal? Can we thank Him that He never changes? Can we thank Him that He is self-sufficient? Can we thank Him that He is always with us and He never leaves us? He's always in His presence. And can we thank Him that He is in 100% control? He is 100% sovereign. Amen. Stand to your feet with me this morning.